I wanted to create an impact that involved creating conversation in our community um, because I know that a lot of our indigenous folks know the problems we face, you know, with our missing and murdered relatives, but a lot of our non-indigenous members of our community do not. And so I created those red dresses to create a conversation. It was inspired by the portrait that Dustin Newman, a fellow Unanga artist, created, which represented our missing and murdered um, sisters here from all areas of Alaska. And when I saw the portrait, I decided that I wanted to make those dresses come alive. Our sister's red dress collection has been shown in Alaska, Washington State, and has journeyed all the way to Paris. It was recently the centerpiece of an exhibit at the Washington History Museum in Seattle, where it received much public attention. Well, I think for a lot of our indigenous community, it is creating like healing, a part of a healing process and a healing space. Um, a lot of um, people have come up and, you know, told me that it was healing and they shared their stories in relations to a missing and murder relative. Um, and then non-Indigenous folks have come up, you know, I answered their questions for them and we, we got to talk about it and yeah, it was very eye-opening for a lot of people. Personally, for me, um, when I was little, when I was young, when I was eight, my best friend in, in school was taken by her stepfather. And then um, several years down the road, uh, my cousin was also taken by her, her partner. So um, yeah, so that's been, you know, kind of near and dear to me. And then also just, just knowing, you know, friends and relatives and people that I just know also experiencing the same. Other Alaska Native artists are also featuring their work to raise awareness of missing and murdered Indigenous people. I didn't realize until I did the project how, how many women I knew who had either been murdered or gone missing, and I didn't realize how big of an impact that had on shaping my identity, like how I walk around in the world, where I'll go and where I won't go, um, and how I teach my daughters to be safe. Um, because I think the first, the first time that I, um, the first time that I knew of a, a native woman that had been murdered, I, I was very young, and I don't even know how I knew she was native. But there was a story in, in the newspaper that my parents were talking about this woman that was found at Kincaid Park, and I don't know how I knew, but I just knew she was native. And and so even at seven years old, I had an understanding that that was the reality that we experienced. It's also personal for Webb, who had a family friend go missing. Several years ago, Webb had an overwhelming sense to do something. She created a nearly 13-foot tall cusp buck featuring hand-drawn portraits with permanent marker of women who've gone missing or have been murdered to make sure they're honored and not forgotten. I realized I wasn't going to be able to find portraits of all of the Native women from Alaska who've been murdered because there was no way to even quantify that because so many don't even have never been tracked. It's never it's never been like like in my grandmother and my great grandmother's generation, nobody was tracking that. People don't even know. And so I decided to look to the work that was being done in Canada and all over North America and I wanted to honor all of the activism that had been happening. And this was people's grandmas, people's aunties, people who died before anything happened, like people who lived their whole lives fighting for this. Those are the people that we, that like made us who we are and those are the people that allowed all of us who are doing activism now to have a platform to do what we're doing. Webb also wants to make sure stereotypes are dispelled. The violence happens anywhere Native women are and it's a part of colonization. And then I started realizing that it was really tied into the experience of boarding school trauma and, in, and tied into the experience of like that people had during forced removal. And, and that the violence we're experiencing today is the same violence. It's the same violence that our grandmas and our great grandmas experienced. And 
I know there's a lot of awareness and I know that there are things happening, but I also know that when we talk about violence, it's really important to name it. It's important to name where the violence comes from and who's doing it. Um, it's, you, you could say Native women are killed at alarming rates, or you could say um, people are killing Native women. And who are those people? And we know that 90% um, of them are non-Native people. And even the ones that are Native are coming from places who have experienced high, high rates of trauma. Those who've survived violence say communities need to have support systems and lift taboos, making it safe to talk about violence in order to help in the healing process. To have the community really acknowledge that our women have suffered and that they need all of us to gather and to heal, right? Because what we want to do is we want to break the silence to break the cycle so that the next generations don't have this same um, level of trauma that we have. But we want to teach them um, how to have healthy coping skills, how to reach out to people and, and get the support that you need to heal. It may be hard for Alaska Native communities to confront these tough issues, but a tribal leader is having some hard conversations in his work and his own self-reflection as a leader. When you talk about, um, you know, domestic violence, when you talk about murder and missing indigenous women and people, that through line of trauma is there. And <clears throat> it, it's hard to have to admit some of these things. It's hard to have these conversations and realize when you look across the nation and you look at other groups of people, Native Americans, Alaskan Natives are not treated with equity. You know, some of the programs, we get the lowest percentage of recognition of funding um, and we're expected to do more. And you create programs that put a pocket here, a pocket there of funding, but you have to have wraparound services. You have to have healing as part of it. As a leader, when we talk about healing, I'm going to stand up and say these things. I'm going to stand up and say the things that scare me. It's really hard to pull these things out of the dark and put them in the light. But I'm going to hold myself accountable, and I'm going to hold others accountable. You know, heal, healing's a journey. And it's like any journey, it's usually better walked with others. And I want to be the person to walk with people and support them and make sure that they have what they need to walk that journey successfully. Government officials say addressing missing and murdered indigenous people needs collaboration on all levels, from federal, state, local to the community. U.S. Department of Justice representatives talked about action on MMIP taking place in Alaska on the radio show Alaska's Native Voice. One of the ways we're trying to address some of the problems in the past is I, I, in, you know, 50s and 60s and 70s, you'd have some bureaucrat in Washington say, well, we've studied the issue theoretically and we've developed this plan and here's the plan. Boom. It's a cookie cutter approach all across Alaska or even in the lower 48. What we're trying to do now, and the great thing about this, is so much of this is um, for the villages themselves, created by the villages themselves, and like the tribal community response plans. We go into the village, we say we're here to help, we provide a framework to talk, but it's their plan. We are also with the um, Alaska um, uh, Tribal Public Safety Commission. We're meeting for the next couple years with natives and and all law enforcement to develop something that comes up from the ground up that will we hope will address the the actual problems on the ground and not those theoretical helicopter problems that the people in Washington so often see so we are very hopeful that by involving the communities to the extent we are that we can address a lot of those um, previous problems that we have you know, we've, we've listened all over Alaska. So we, we partner with the regional uh, associations here in Alaska um, and, and started that really when I started the work, going out and doing listening sessions, uh, initially virtually um, and now in person and, and in hybrids. 
um, and and what we what we have heard is we have heard stories like Brian talks about of resilience, um, of healing, and and really of of that um, that history. You know, we've talked about solutions with families, um, but we've definitely talked about the history. Of, of what those families are walking through and how do we change that narrative? How do we change the history and make sure that it is different for the children that are coming now? Um, develop safety plans um, to make sure that, that we are creating a safer Alaska, uh, that public safety is the expectation that we expect in every community is the expectation that we're going to see all over Alaska. Um, we just had a listening session last night uh, with the Alaska Tribal Public Safety Advisory Committee. Um, which was established by, by VAWA, the reauthorization of, of 2022. Um, and, you know, we, we had uh, community members and agency leaders there telling us, you know, this is something we have to do. We, we absolutely need to increase public safety. Um, and, we, and they're telling us that um, that includes, again, building that tribal capacity, you know, giving authority um, or supporting that enhanced um, tribal capacity. Um, and, and you see some of that in, in VAWA, that, that uh, recognition, again, of that, that jurisdiction that they had that was their concurrent jurisdiction with tribal authority. Um, and and the different authorities uh, and so just recognizing that and and having them exercise that that's something that we hear a lot from our, our tribal folks I think that we all need to use our voices to kind of stand up for our relatives who can can't speak and I know that it sometimes it's really hard to use our voices and I'm getting better at using my voice and sharing the story of, of our relatives. And um, yeah, I'm just gonna keep sharing the collection for as long as I can and for as long as I have to. So when people look at each one of those faces, I want them to see the humanity and the life that was there. Um, because it's not about how they died, it's about how they lived. And it's about how we live in their honor. And um, how we protect each other. In Anchorage, I'm Antonia Gonzalez. This story is supported by the Public Welfare Foundation, committed to advancing a transformative approach to justice that is community-led, restorative, and racially just. Learn more at publicwelfare.org.